this IS webinar. My name is Amir Yazdani, and uh, I'm currently working as a lecturer of electrical engineering at Metro Merdach University, Australia. I'm also a, mem a committee member of IEEE IES Western Australia chapter. So today it is my great honor to have our speaker, Dr. Jose Luis Sanchez Lopez from University of Luxembourg, who is going to talk about situationally aware robots for indoor service application. Uh, Dr. Jose is a research scientist at the Interdisciplinary uh, Center for Security, Reliability and Trust of the University of Luxembourg since 2021. He is the head of Aerial Robotics Lab and the leader of Situational Awareness Research Line and the ongoing mobile service robotics related projects of the Automation and Robotics Research Group. In his more than 12 years of experience, he has worked on providing robots with essential capabilities to make them more autonomous and intelligent. His contributions are in three main areas, perception and situational awareness, intelligent and cognitive system architecture, and trajectory and past planning and control. All the outcomes of his research have always been experimentally validated in applied research and technology transfer project, being the scientific results disseminated in more than 70 publications, renowned international peer-reviewed journals and conference proceeding with impact of around 1,900 citations, according to his Google Scholar. He is an associate editor of four international journals, international program committee of several international conferences, and he is an expert evaluator of project proposals. OK, without further ado, let's uh, invite uh, Jose to uh, start his presentation. Jose, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amir Mendy. Uh, let me try to share my screen. Okay, can you see it? Yes, we can. Please start. Perfect, perfect. Thank you very much. And do you hear me well also? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you for the nice introduction and of course for the for the invitation to participate here. Um, so, as mentioned, I will be talking about my la latest research I'm doing. I'm working on situationally aware mobile robots, uh, especially focusing on indoor uh, service application. Uh, as mentioned, I'm a research scientist, a permanent research scientist at the University of Luxembourg. Um, and, well, for those that they don't know the University of Luxembourg, just a little brief introduction. So the University of Luxembourg, first of all, Luxembourg is a very tiny country in Europe. Uh, it's a founding member of the European Union and it's located between Germany, France and Belgium. Um, and the University of Luxembourg is quite young. It's only 20 years old. And it was founded uh, having in mind that uh, it cannot compete with the nearby universities of France and Belgium in, in terms of education, in terms of teaching, but it was, had a focus then on research. So you can see here some figures that there are around 6,000 undergraduates and master's students, and there are 1,000 PhD students. So this is uh, a little six undergraduate and master's students per one PhD student. And there are also 1,200 uh, postdocs at the university. Uh, for also 300 uh, professors. So you see already that these figures are not common for uh, uh, teaching more traditional teaching universities. Um, then the university is divided in three faculties and three research centers. Uh, I belong to one of these research centers. Uh, it, his, its name is Interdisciplinary Center for Security, Reliability and Trust, or in short, we call it s and um, and then uh, I belong to the Automation and Robotics Research Group, which is headed by Professor Holger Bott, uh, and I'm the second on board. I'm the co-head of, of this research group. 
Uh, in the research group, we have uh, three research lines, which are situational awareness for robots, which I'm leading, optimization for planning and automation, where I also contribute, but I'm not the leader, and advanced control and actuation, and similar. I contribute, but I'm not leading. And we apply these three research lines to different uh, areas. Uh, one of them is construction applications, but we also have aerial robotics and aerial manipulation, Industry 4.0, autonomous driving, space applications, and etc. Uh, we have uh, several labs at the s and and our research group. Uh, one of them is the Aerial Robotics Lab, which I'm the head also, as it was mentioned. Uh, also the Service Robotics Lab, which I'm also the head. And we have other labs like the Industry 4.0, Autonomous Vehicles Lab, and we have several space labs. So after this very quick introduction of what is the University of Luxembourg and what is my research center, I will start with the with the main part of the talk. Since we are not too many in the audience, if you have any questions, also feel free to interrupt me whenever you want, if you have a question. So I will start, but again, please feel free to interrupt me. So I will start with an introduction, very briefly, uh, to motivate why do we need situationally aware robots, and then I will get deep into a situational into the two main research areas I'm working. The first part is the situational awareness, where I will present our latest research orbiting around what we call situational graphs. And then I will present the, last, the latest works we are working in decision making and execution, also uh, orbiting around situational graphs. And I will finish the presentation with some conclusion. So, why do we need robots? that have a deep understanding and a deep uh, awareness of the situation. Well, that's, that's something uh, that it has never uh, deeply studied. Uh, we are used to have the guys working on perception, on slam, on localization, and then the guys working in control and in planning. But actually, real robots need to have everything well connected. And the better the situational awareness is, the better you can do decision making and execution. And this is something we really, as roboticists, researchers, robot researchers, we need to really think in a holistic way. Uh, the, the two parts, the situational awareness and the decision making and execution, must be very linked. Um, then uh, I try to also take a holistic uh, approach to what is the definition of situational awareness. Because again, in robotics, all over the years, it has been split in uh, several fields. We have from perception, computer vision, state estimation, localization, slam. And then I try to, to have this more holistic approach, trying to understand what is really the meaning of situational awareness. And uh, I came across some quite old articles um, where they were trying to descri describe uh, in general, uh, what situational awareness means, not for robots, but in general for humans and for other countries like military, aviation, etc. And I thought, okay, we should definitely also apply this idea of situational awareness to robotics. So then this is, this is what I'm trying to do in, in my research, to extend this overall holistic concept of situational awareness that has been widely applied in other fields. Uh, to robotics and combining what we have done already in the past in robotics into this big overview of, of, of situational awareness. So then um, I start with the research part. Then we, we came with the idea of, well, when we are doing um, SLAM, uh, we are using this, now the big trend is using both graphs, okay? So we are using these uh, graphs with the keyframes uh, and, and, the, and the point clouds or the, or the images, you know, do this optimization and then we get um, the, the, you know, the, the history of where the robot has been and then the map that, that has visited. So this is like the traditional post graph slab. On the other hand, 
there are also uh, works doing these scene graphs, which they are trying to model uh, the scene uh, with some semantic and relational uh, concepts. So for example, they are saying, okay, there is a chair, there is a table, there is a computer, and also the computer is on the table, the chair is on the floor, and maybe they can even go beyond this. They can also state the shape of the chair, the shape of the of the table, uh, the dynamic properties. Like for example, you know, the table normally is always, you know, with the with the legs touching the floor and the up part, you know, up, um, and it's normally never flipped. Maybe in some cases, but it's very, it's very unlikely. It's never floating on the space. It's always touching the floor, you know. So, so you have these relationships, and this is in the scene graphs. So, we came with the the need, the idea of creating what we call the situational graph that actually combines both the scene graph and the post graph in one single graph. And this is something that. Nowadays, other researchers, you, you, may, you may know Luca Carlone, he's also working on, on this idea. Um, but our main idea, compared with Luca Carlone, is that this graph must also be uh, optimizable. So it must be a factor graph that we can optimize. It's not that we have two separate parts of the graph, the slam post graph, that we is a factor graph that we optimize, and then we build on top the scene graph. No, we believe that everything has to be a single graph that can be optimized. And uh, this is how we started doing our research. And we started uh, with these situational graphs uh, for LiDAR, using LiDAR, okay? And uh, we have started our research in indoors, uh, man-made uh, environments. Why indoor man-made? Well, first of all, because we have a project uh, related to construction that require to, to have this set in place. Uh, and second, because, well, you can more easily extract all these semantic features and all this relationship because it's really full of objects and full of this, this kind of semantic entities in their environment. Of course, outdoor environment, like for example, a city, they have also a lot of this kind of semantic, like cars, trees, buildings, uh, but they are a little more complex and we are not working that much on outdoors, but we believe it could be also extended. But in this in this um, talk, I'm focusing on indoor application, okay? So um, yeah, uh, applying this idea of this situational graph, but simplifying it because of course it was only, we are only starting, uh, we already came with the following semantic entities. So we came with walls. Actually, now we call it wall surfaces, uh, rooms, and floors. So there are only these three very basic semantic entities, high-level semantic entities, wall surfaces, rooms, and floors. But we were able to find also relationships between them. And uh, while the robot is moving, it's creating keyframes, is then segmenting the wall surfaces and mapping them, and then mapping the rooms, and then also mapping the floors, you know? And finally, it's building in real time uh, this big situational graph, okay? It's, again, tightly coupled. So we are optimizing everything in the same graph. It's not a two-step thing. It's a full, tightly coupled optimization of the graph with all the uh, geometric semantic relational abstractions. It's just, uh, as I mentioned, it's still real time capable, but of course, of course, we see that with the complexity, uh, when it grows in complexity, uh, of course, it becomes more slow. But we are, anyways, working on how to tackle this problem. And uh, this has been published in one paper in RAL last year. And actually, two days ago, we got the acceptance of the second version, S Graph Plus, uh, also accepted for for RAL. So, but you anyways have already available the preprints if you want to check it. And um, here I'm showing some results as a video. 
So you can see uh, this is a data set, a real data set uh, of the robot. We have a Boston Dynamics spot robot. Let me just stop the video here. Oh. We have a Boston Dynamics spot robot uh, walking in this floor of a building that is under construction. And yeah, as you saw, it's able to segment uh, in real time the, the walls and then build all the rooms and then the floors. And this is, here you have the, the, the keyframes uh, in different colors because as long as the robot is progressing, uh, you are using the different colors. And uh, you see that finally uh, we managed to get a very clean uh, map of the environment where of course we have the full point cloud with everything that is around, but we have highlighted the semantic entities that we have mapped again the wall surfaces, the rooms, and the floor, okay? And I will let it run the video again. Uh, this is another data set on another floor. And this is again the top view. And you really see that the, the map is, is very clean. Uh, we have compared with the state of the art. Um, and we uh, got uh, improvements of up to, if I'm not very mistaken, 30% in uh, the map estimation um, compared with the, the state of the art counterpart in LiDAR SLAM, semantic LiDAR SLAM. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, then now we are working still on how to improve this. Um, of course, uh, the trick here is that we need to come with uh, a model of mathematical model to describe each uh, semantic entity and also with a mathematical model to describe each relationship between semantic entities. So this is something that is, is a little tricky. Uh, and we are now working on yeah how to have multiple floors. Uh, multiple floors are connected with staircases uh and also to have windows I, I didn't mention it because in this work uh, we don't have it available yet in the next work you will see it but we have already uh, doorways and doorways are semantic entities that are connecting floors okay uh, another thing we are also working now is uh, as i mentioned is tricky to get the mathematical definition of all the semantic entities and especially also the mathematical definition um, of uh, the relationship between the semantic entities. So we are trying to use machine learning algorithms to let the, the algorithm learn on its own uh, these uh, mathematical definitions. So we will present data sets to the to the algorithm and then it will be able to to learn it and another point we are actually working on is uh, how to improve uh, the graph optimization because if we try to do all the graph optimization at once uh, this as i mentioned will slow down the optimization and eventually if the graph is very big it will not be real time capable but having this situational graph allows to do a hierarchical optimization. That means if we have two different floors, there's no need to optimize the two different floors at the same time. So we can just optimize the first floor, then the second floor, and then we marginalize, and then we optimize the relationship between them. And this applies also if we're in one single floor and we have different rooms. Again, we can optimize each room individually, and then we marginalize, and then we optimize the floor on its own. And if we have objects inside a room, we don't need to optimize all the objects inside all the rooms at the same time. We can just optimize room-wise all the objects in the room. Okay, so this has the possibility to really improve uh, the optimization by doing this hierarchical optimization. And definitely we expect to, to have, first of all, a richer knowledge of the environment thanks to these machine learning approaches uh, that will be used not only for the robot understanding to improve its localization and mapping, but also to be used uh, for the final end user, for example, as a digital twin. Uh, and 
we also expect to to reduce the computational burden. Okay, that that was with lidar, and then we started to wonder, okay, can we do the same with computer vision? Um, and then we started to to work on this project. Uh, this is marker based visual S graph. Uh, why marker based? Well, first of all, because we also have a project. Uh, that requires us to work with with markers, with fiducial markers. Concretely, uh, you can see in the right image, the bottom right image, uh, we have some invisible markers. Uh, so the idea is that we can label some semantic entities, like for example, a doorway or a wall or a room with these invisible markers that are invisible for the human eye. But then the robot with the correct device that is also here in the, the bottom right picture, um, the robot can read this and easily understand, okay, this is this semantic entity. Okay, then I can map it in my situational graph. Okay. Uh, this is, a, we have a, an ongoing project with the physics department of the university and they are the ones developing these invisible markers. We are mostly working on the robotics part. Uh, so in this first, very, very first work, we use visible markers, visible fiducial markers, but it was just to prove that it makes sense, okay, to, to use this, this approach. So what we did here is, okay, uh, we have the same uh, structure. Now the keyframes, instead of being LiDAR keyframes, will be visual keyframes, images. And uh, now, in order to segment the walls, instead of using just a ransack algorithm over the point cloud, we will use a visual marker, and then we will say, oh, there is a wall here. And then uh, uh, we will be able to use ransack also with all the key points to segment the wall. And then also we can encode in the visual marker, in the fiducial marker, that this wall belongs to a room. Okay, so then we can encode that several walls belong to the same room. And uh, then we have a similar situational graph uh, that we made it work uh, with, in this first work with a monocular, with a monocular camera, okay? Uh, the paper that presents the work, well, we have first a survey on the of Islam, uh, we have also a paper on invisible fiducial markers, and the, the paper presenting this situational graph, uh, market-based visual situational graph, uh, has also been yesterday accepted for, for IROS, uh, but you have the preprints in this link, okay? Uh, and you can see that thanks to this approach, we can actually build, again, a much more clean map uh, than if we would not use uh, this situational graph. Okay, so here you have a video, uh, how it is working also in real time, and how little by little is building and optimizing the graph, situational graph, you see, and uh, yeah. Uh, so we are now working on the next version of this of this work, and. Um, we want to extend this uh, to visual inertia and uh, uh, to RGBD. Um, of course, uh, if you have ever worked with monocular SLAM, you know the, the limitations. It gets lost very easily. It really heavily depends on, on having a, a very featured environment. So we want to go a little beyond this limitation with visual inertia and RGBD. But the shape of the graph, should be the same, you know, is that we are using different sensor measurements. Um, we are also working on using machine learning for image segmentation and object representation. So, okay, we want to still use fiducial markers, but to encode a really worth it uh, semantic information. So there are already very nice algorithms uh, to segment, for example, walls in images, wall surfaces in images. So what is the point of using this visual marker or fiducial marker to, to label these wall surfaces? This, this makes not too much sense. And this is why, yeah, 
we want to get rid of the visual markers, of, sorry, the fiducial markers to encode simple semantic entities and we want to really use them for complex semantic entities, okay? And uh, yeah, as I mentioned also, we will integrate in the next work already the invisible markers that in the previous work were still not available. And well, of course, we expect to improve the localization and mapping accuracy. Of course, we want to have a better performance when no markers are detected, not only because we are using visual inertia and NRGVD, but because we are relying less and less on markers for, as I said, wall surface segmentation. And of course, having not, not having visual markers, having invisible, invisible markers will reduce the visual pollution of the environment. Uh, another work we have done in around this same concept uh, is uh, this more complex one. It's called Inform Situational Graphs or IS Graphs with Architectural Graphs. Okay, so here the idea is a little different than before. So before we were doing a full slab. Here we are going to assume that there is some background knowledge, existing background knowledge of the environment. For example, we can get this knowledge uh, from Revit or Beam, this building information model. Uh, and then what we do is we transform this Beam into what we call the A graph, which is basically the top layers of the S graph, the situational graphs. So all the layers without the keyframes, okay? And then we connect both the S graph with the A graph. So the robot starts to move, does not know where it is, you know, and it starts to build a S graph, as we saw before, either with markers, visual, visual slam, or either with LiDAR, okay? And then it's trying to match uh, this graph, situational graph, with the existing architectural graph, and then Eventually, when it managed to match it and say, okay, this room is this one, this other room is this one, you know, then it will merge both graphs and then it will have one single informed situational graph. And uh, with this, we will be able to, first of all, have a global localization of the robot, okay, because then we can localize the robot in the architectural graph. Uh, and it's a global localization of the robot done by a graph-based approach, okay? We have another work where we are doing this with a particle filter, but this is more powerful because it's really using graphs. It's doing graph matching and then graph merging, okay? And the second important thing is that in the beam, you have a lot of information that maybe you are not able to extract with your sensors. For example, in the beam, we know walls, again, walls versus wall surfaces. So a wall is a new semantic entity that relates two wall surfaces, okay? Or for example, here is where we have doorways. Doorways are relating other two semantic entities or several semantic entities, but normally two, that are uh, rooms. And this information can be very, very easily extracted from the beam, from the A graph, but it's very difficult to extract this for the S graph, from the S graph, because then you need a proper perception algorithm. But by merging these two graphs and having the I S graph, then we can have in one single graph the global localization, the robot there, and also all these semantic relational information. Uh, so this work also has been accepted yesterday for publication in iOS, but you also have the preprints in this second link. And here you have some a video with the results. Um, it's, it goes very quickly, the video, but you can see how at the very beginning the robot is moving, and whenever it manages to find a match, then it merges both graphs, and then it continues putting keyframes in the map uh, and having the point cloud and also improving the IS graph, okay? But taking advantage of it. 
we are again working on the next version of this um, that will first of all include new semantic abstractions from Revit, like I mentioned before, staircases. Again, this is very, very simple to extract from, from Revit. Windows, Windows, as you may know, they are quite challenging to detect uh, using sensors, especially LiDAR, but you can get it very easily from Revit. So even if the robot cannot perceive them, it can know that the window is there, okay? Uh, another thing we want to do is uh, to compute deviations between the S graph, which is the as built, and the A graph, which is the as planned. This is, again, a requirement for the project we are working on. And because so far we have assumed that the beam, the A graph, is perfect. It, it represents the environment. So the as planned is exactly as the as built. But this is not always the case. Okay, so we really want to be tolerant to these potential deviations and also compute these deviations. So we will, of course, increase the accuracy on the localization and map mapping thanks to knowing the deviations, not just assuming it's perfect. But also, it will be used as a digital twin uh, with deviations for for the final user. For the final user. Another next step we have taken in in this direction of the situational graph is, okay, uh, what if we have multiple robots? Uh, so we have extended this to multiple robots, but this would be also the same for multi-session slab, you know, uh, working in the same environment. So the idea is that each robot is building its own situational graph, and they are checking if there is any matching between the graph of the two robots. And eventually, if they manage to get a match, then they are able to merge the two graphs into one single situational graph with both robots uh, are included. Okay, and the optimization then, then there is also this problem that how do you do the optimization? So, so far we are doing it in a decentralized way, but it could also be done in a centralized way, but it has extra challenges, okay? So that's the the you know the first hints of on the situational awareness. Uh, but now it's okay, very nice. The situational awareness, the situational graph, they really improve the accuracy, on the, you know, the the performance, the, the the information that the robot has. But can we also use this for decision making and execution? And the question is, the answer is yes, we can. And, and we are actually working now on, on developing these algorithms for decision making and execution that take advantage of this situational graph. So the first work we are we are doing, so the, the, the paper will be submitted in eight days, um, is let's do a path planning using S graphs. So here the assumption is that the robot is in a known environment, maybe because it has a previously visited S graph, or because there is an existing A graph, architectural graph, okay? And yeah, this is taking advantage of the, the relationships that we are encoding, uh, the semantic relationships that we are encoding in this graph, in the S graph. So we are connecting rooms through doorways, and we are connecting floors through stairways, okay? So the workflow consists on, okay, first we do a semantic relational planner in the situational graph. And then we do a semantic geometric planner uh, using the, the key point, the, the um, point cloud, okay? And so let me give you an example. So here in this, Figure. I don't know if you see my. I hope you can see my my mouse. So in in this figure in the bottom, you have yeah, floor rooms. So you have basically the high level layers of, of the situational graph. So if we want the robot to go from room one to room two, then it has to go from room one passing through door one and then finally reaching to room two. 
Okay, and this is the the first semantic relational planner planning that we do, and this is really really fast because it's a really small graph. Uh, and then once we have this initial plan, we refine this plan uh, at a geometric level. Okay, so here you see in the other figures in the top right uh, how the first stage is this semantic relational plan that managed to, to go from initial point to final point to create this in green, the, the path. Uh, and here you see uh, different queries using geometric plans. Actually, I just realized that here another room was selected. So we can use for the geometric planner, the PRM or other state of the art, I inform RRT or bit start, you know, and you see, how well in this case the PRM is from going to here to this other room. Okay, I don't know why my my postdoc decided to change a little here. Um, but here it goes from this room to this other room, and here from this room to this other room. Okay, but you see how it is much more efficient using this geometric algorithm than if you just use directly a pure geometric planner. So you see if you don't have any semantic knowledge of the plan, then the PRM has to cover really all the map. The IRRT, of course, it uses managed also to find a plan, you know, but you can see in this other counterpart, it's really focusing on the rooms where the robot knows it has to go through. So for example, this room here, the robot does not need to pass, but the, geomet the pure geometric plan is putting some nodes here while in the semantic one, it's really not even checking. And the same happens with the bit start. There are some points here, but in the taking advantage with the semantic, there is no need. So then you can use, you can either plan faster or you can either use the same planning time to refine and make a better plan. So you see here the density of the points uh, in the rooms that the robot really needs to go through is higher than in this one, although they have the same number of, of nodes, you know. But you can go a little beyond this, and you can actually subdivide the problem uh, in subproblems to have a higher efficiency and also to be able to replan faster. So. Rather than saying, okay, I want to go from this room to this room uh, via this room, this room, and this room, you can say, okay, let's go from this room to this door within this room. From this room, from sorry, from this door to this door via this room, and from this door to the final point via this room. And then this actually makes a big change and it's much, much, much faster even than the previous approach. And you see how with very, very limited nodes, it really finds a very good solution for the planning. Okay. The second possibility is, okay, let's assume we don't know the environment is an unknown environment, so let's explore it. And let's also take advantage of these test graphs to, to improve the exploration. Okay. Here we only have some very, very preliminary results, but the idea is, is the same. So rather than fully trusting on this uh, frontier exploration, we also say, okay, let's explore room by room. So let's go to this room, to this other room, to this other room. And whenever you discover that you are in a room, it does not make sense to keep on exploring. Or you only explore the doorways. Where are doorways, and then you find the doorway, and then okay, we can go through this doorway or this other doorway. But you are taking advantage of the semantic uh, exploration, okay? And as, as I said, I don't have too many results, so this is only the, the preliminary results we have here. Hopefully, in September we will have a paper submitted. Okay, so. Um, that was a little a hint of my research. I hope I convinced you, but let me just wrap up the conclusions. So we understood uh, that 
we need to tackle in an holistic way the robotic capabilities, uh, especially the situational awareness. Uh, and we have developed this new idea of what is a situational graph encoding or you know having in the same graph what we normally have in slam this post graph and also the scene graph in a single graph that can be optimized then we explore lidar based approaches and market based visual approaches then we went a little beyond this and then we said okay what if we have some background knowledge the, the from beam and then we created the a graph based on the beam and then we merge this situational graph and the A graph and the architectural graph into what we call the informed situational graph, IS graph. And we also went a little beyond this and we went to multi robot situational graph that, again, is also very similar to multi session uh, S graph. Then we move to the application. So how we can exploit these situational graphs uh, for path planning and for exploration. And uh, we already saw very, very promising results in path planning. Uh, it's, as we said, we do first a semantic plan and then we go for the geometric plan rather than just going for a geometric planner directly. And the same applies to exploration. We can take advantage of the semantics and the relationship between the semantics to improve the performance on the exploration. So uh, that's all from my side. Uh, if you have any questions or any comments, feedback, I'm very, very happy to, to hear it and to try my best to answer it. And again, it was a very pleasure for me to, to stay here with you today. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you very much, Jose, for your fantastic, insightful presentation. I really enjoyed that. So it's time for our audience to raise questions. If there is any, please feel free to ask your question. Yes, Krishna, please. I have actually a couple of questions. Anyway, thank you, Jose. Luis. That was a really good presentation. Um, it was really informative. Um, so I am currently doing research in multi robots, um, but um, I have a couple of questions, <laughs> but um, I'll just go with the multi robot one first. So um, I'm just wondering how these robots are actu actually exchanging information when you're using multi robots and um, how they can actually coordinate the mapping like if they if there is more than one robots in one room at a time mm -hmm. um so they prob i believe they are probably going around without any collision um but still at the end of the mapping how they actually cooperate to the final mapping i mean because they probably get double up so if there is two robots um both of them going to get same um data so how they're going to finalize to oh okay these two data are the same so it, we can actually put them in one you know one side so it's we can actually how they coordinate it like i mean mm -hmm. the information mm -hmm. yeah th those are really really good questions thank you thank you very much uh so first of all we are not uh, steering the robot to to perform a better uh, mapping Okay, so we assume that the robots are moving in the same environment and then they are merging the information they have in the environment. Okay, so, so that's the first important thing to mention. Second, uh, the information we are exchanging between them, we, in this first work, we decided to go for a distributed approach. So there is no central uh, coordinator, but they are just sharing the information whenever they are nearby and uh, the interesting thing of this approach is that it's really really uh, efficient also in terms of information you transfer in bandwidth because you don't need to transfer all the point cloud or all the image keyframes you just need to transfer the graph the, the high level part of the graph the mm -hmm. rooms the doorways etc and then once you have transferred this, then we have developed like a kind of descriptor, simplified descriptor uh, for each uh, semantic entity. 
So for example, for rooms, uh, we have just a very, very simple descriptor. Uh, and then the robots, what they are doing is using the graph structure, they are comparing if there are some matches, some potential candidates, you know, and uh, then comparing the different descriptors. And eventually, when they are 100% sure that this room is the same, this other room, then they proceed to the merge of the graph. Of course, if they are not 100% sure, they don't merge the graph because then they will create a problem. But if, if they are sure because the descriptor match, the graph match, you know, all these hierarchical uh, rules, mm -hmm. they all match, then they merge it. Okay. Okay. I don't know if this answers your question. Uh, yeah, yeah, I got, yes. Um, yeah, I got what, what do you really mean, yeah. And can I go more questions? Um, Good for me. <laughs> yeah. So the next one uh, is basically, did you consider a dynamic environment when you do mapping? I mean, um, lots of moving people or objects or, um, yeah. That, that's also a really good question. So it's in our roadmap to map also these dynamic things. But anyways, our environments are cluttered. So there are many objects, many dynamic things. But mm. since we are uh, segmenting, for example, the walls and only mapping the walls, then they are kind of filtered out, all these things. Mm. Okay. So then the map is really not polluted by these things. Okay. But of yeah, course, okay. the idea would be in the future, we can actually also map these things in the map. You know, put, mm -hmm. put the objects in the map, like objects, tables, whatever, or person moving, we could track eventually the directory of these persons that are moving or other robots. But uh, so far, we are kind of filtering them out. Okay. So are you considering the time duration to do one room? Like, I mean, how long it takes to map? A, um, it doesn't matter as a multi-robot or single robot. Like, I mean, how long it's uh, a standard sized room? I mean, are you considering any temporal constraints at this point? Uh, I don't know if I fully understand the question. So to map one room, so the, the algorithm is real time capable. Okay. So mm -hmm. how, how much time it takes to map a room, it depends on, first of all, the sensor we are using, and also if we are able to properly detect all the walls and the semantic entities we need to map a room. So, yeah, for example, in the case of a LiDAR, when we have a LiDAR, then it's a 360 LiDAR. So, if we are lucky, we are able to see all the walls in maybe just one keyframe. So then, okay, in one keyframe, we have already mapped everything. Maybe there, there is a table or a, on some object here, so the robot needs to really move around to be able to see all the worlds. So then, okay, we need more keyframes. And of course, in the case of the visual uh, algorithm, in terms of cameras, cameras are not 360, so we really need to move the robot a little around in order to map everything. Yeah, okay, yeah. So they probably need to go the same path uh, more than once. Um, is that like, to get a proper mapping, is that what you mean? Like, not necessarily. So you can see here in this, for example, here. So you see that this is the path that the robot did. You know. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's not really coming back. It's just okay. Advancing. It's just going forward. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's just advancing. Here, for example, uh, we did a loop closer on purpose to see how mm. it was closing the loop, uh, yeah. and it worked very well. Of course. I didn't get into the details, but to do a loop closer, you also take advantage of the semantic information you have available. So you don't do the do loop closer at a key point level. You do the loop closer first using the information of the room. So is this room the same room? Yes. Okay, then this is a candidate. And then you try to do the loop closer only with room with this room, you oh. know? Uh, but you see here is like advancing all the time, except in this part that is looping, closing the loop. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, one more question and the last question. <laughs> so you mentioned that um, uh, the optimization, the hierarchical optimization that you have used, because that there comes with building, floor, rooms. Yeah. So you can actually simplify that. But then when it comes to one room, like, I mean, what sort of optimization algorithm that you have uh, used and why? Uh, so Is it? Well, First of all, this hierarchical optimization is, we have 
we are working on it. Okay, so it's still not, okay, yeah. not on place. We are we are working on it, and hopefully by September October we have a submission uh, to run. Uh, but we have already some preliminary results that that already validate the the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, we are using a GTSAM a library to optimize. Sorry, what uh, was that? GTSAM. It's, GT... it's a SAM, yes. GTSAM, okay. GT and also G2O. These are the okay. two very big libraries for graph optimization. Uh, I don't know exactly all the details. I could ask uh, my team to give me exactly all the details, but uh, we are not using a very different optimizer. It's the standard optimizers and the standard algorithms that they are used for post graph optimization. Okay, all right. Okay, so yeah. that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Krishna, and thank you, Jose. So, any more question? Yes, please, Shaira. You are muted, so please unmute and ask your question. Sharon, we cannot hear you. Uh, you may want to type in a chat box if you cannot, uh, you know, if your mic is not working. Uh, all right, so let's uh, us ask the other one. Okay. If there is any question, please feel free to ask. And we wait for Sharon to fix the mic. No more question. I, I have one more. Sorry. Uh, yes, Krishna, please. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, the three methods that LIDAR based and um, LIDAR based and marker based and the third one. So which one you personally find um, more efficient? Mm. So we have the, the LiDAR base, we have the market based visual based. graph, and, and then the we have informed, informed situational graph. Yeah, so yeah. The, the informed situational graph is actually mm, not a, like a new method, it's just exploiting the background information. Okay, so of, of course, this is the best because you have more information available. Yeah. Uh, but in real time, it's not, yeah. Yeah, no, in real time, it works the same. Uh, but you have more information, but no, you don't always have this information, and this is more also focused on global localization. So let's say that in order to be a fair comparing, to do a full slam from scratch without background information would be, okay, LiDAR versus market-based visual. Of course, I like more LiDAR <laughs> because, first of all, it was the first one we started and it's more mature. Uh, LiDAR is also very accurate, you know, compared with, with cameras. But um, it has more potential, the, the cameras, you know, because of course you can extract much more information from cameras and we are extending it. And I hope that for in September, when we are planning to submit this ICRA paper with the extension of the visual, uh, it will be as good or even more the visual S graph than the LiDAR S graph, at least. Uh, because if we are already able to segment the walls and to have a similar performance in terms of accuracy and everything, so it may be hopefully at least as good. Of course, LiDAR is much more accurate because it's LiDAR, you know, it's just technology. Okay, thank you. All right, Sharon. Hi, uh, is it audible now? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, hi, hi, Dr. Do Joe, for sharing the informations with us, and it's it was really informative. And yeah. I do have a doubt: like um, you are extracting the S graphs from the B model, and you do have your A graph, and you are merging the F graph actually, right? And finding the matching candidates from that one. 
So my question is like, if you do have a uh, highly repeated environment, or if you do have an, uh, uh, an environment which don't have an sufficient geometric constraints, so uh, adopting this methods will really help to do the LIDAR-based localization with that one. That's, that's a very interesting question. Thank you very much. So methods, so sorry, environments that they have um, these semantic entities, of course, are, are really contributing to the performance of these uh, yeah. algorithms. So yes. if we are in a, for example, in just a big, super huge room with yeah. nothing around, yeah. then of course you cannot exploit the power of this algorithm. And yeah. we have already checked this. What it happens is that it just works as a post graph, simple yes. post graph, okay. so without yeah. taking advantage of all the mm -hmm. higher level semantic mm -hmm. information. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, my question has been answered, yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, another question which comes follow with that one, like it, it's my thought, like if we are not doing just a merging, graph merging with the S and A graph, uh, will the use of that only the S graph will sufficiently improve the LIDAR-based localizations when we are not going for the graph merging? In, in repeating environment. Uh, so you mean doing a matching between two different S graphs? Uh, it, no, it, we are not going to do the graph merging. Uh, yeah. We are simply extracting the info, information from the BI model and making only use of the situational S graph. Will and using the post estimation using that in a repeated environment, will that enable us to improve the localization efficiency? So, uh, let me see if I understood properly the question. So, in this mm -hmm. work I have presented here, sorry, I stopped sharing the screen, so let me ask it again. So, in this work where we are doing this graph based global localization, of yeah. course, we are matching the both graph and then merging them. Yes. But as, as I mentioned, we have done a previous work where mm -hmm. we are not doing this graph matching yeah. and merging. Mm -hmm. We are just taking advantage of a particle filter uh, yeah. to find the global localization. So basically mm -hmm. what we were doing is we are building the A graph in this other work. We are building the A graph. We are putting particles everywhere. Then mm -hmm. we are doing this particle yeah. filter localization, and then we are transferring this global localization to the S graph. So we are not doing yes. any graph matching or graph merging. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. But uh, Thank again, you. that was the previous work, and we saw that this graph matching and merging it was much much better. So this is why yeah. we went in this direction. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much uh, again. And uh, thanks, Jose, for your very insightful and informative presentation. And thanks for ex uh, accepting your invitation. We hope thank to you. see you in the next upcoming uh, webinars. Thank you thank all you for much. attending this webinar. That's the end of session and have a good time. Cheers. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye for, Bye. Bye for now.